a stronger yen as well, although that's counterintuitive. The one that jumps out to me is, uh, is Ireland, which, you know, I think we, at least I know I did. I sit in front of a computer every day, and um, the financial world has become something like a reality TV show that, that's always on. Um, and I don't know if you're an active investor or you're a trader and if you've noticed this, but the pace of things happening and the urgency to immediately decide what does that mean and what should I do, that seems to have accelerated in the last two years. And there's a good reason for that. It's accelerated because the Fed and other central banks have injected so much uncertainty into asset markets that it forces all of us to constantly shorten our time horizons and try to figure out what to do with our money today because of what happened in Japan or Greece overnight. I would suggest that's probably not a good way to plan over the long term. Um, but uh, that's a total aside. My original point here was that um, Ireland is probably the country du jour that looks like it's most likely to be in crisis the soonest because the government has to reach an agreement on reducing debt as a percentage of its GDP. Uh, and unlike the United States... The Irish can't print money. The Greeks can't print money. The Portuguese can't print money. The Italians can't print money. So they cannot upset their creditors or they're going to cause much more serious damage to their economy. The United States doesn't have that problem uh, because its creditors apparently are happy to finance its deficits for now. But that's a lot of money, $10.2 trillion. Where is that money coming from? <laughs> if it's not coming from savers, it's coming from central banks. They're going to monetize it. They're going to print money to finance their own borrowing needs. So you won't just have inflation in one currency, you'll have it in multiple currencies. So next year could be, uh, could be the year where we see these sovereign debt dynamics really start to kick in uh, with inflation. Interestingly enough, I, I just found this out yesterday reading a Barron's article, 60% uh, of the world's $8.1 trillion in foreign exchange reserves are held by 11 countries in Asia. And this makes perfect sense if you understand the economic model of the world for the last, really since the end of World War II. It's been for the low-cost manufacturing companies in the Far East to leverage their labor advantage and produce manufactured goods and sell them to the developed West. And in exchange, they accumulate these large exchange reserves, which kind of ensure their economy from, uh, from instability. But this is, these are the people who are loaning the money because they have the money. But remember, the other figure was 10.2. That's 8.1. So it's smaller. Even if they decided to take all of their foreign exchange reserves and finance the borrowing needs of, of those countries that are borrowing, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, so to me, that says those countries are going to have to, to, to monetize their own debt. This is also a massive problem for these, these Asian exporters. Oh, my goodness. I better hurry. Um, I'm going to go through the rest of this quickly because I, uh, I overestimated my time. Anyway, these are all the countries that are accelerating their move out of the dollar. They know it's going down. They have large forex reserves. Most of those reserves are in the dollar. They've got to get out. Part of what they're going to do is they're going to own gold. Oh, is it? Yeah. That's, that's clear. They're, um, they don't own enough of it right now. This is a, the World Gold Standard or the World Gold Council's uh, September chart on official reserves. Uh, and you can see that. Um, uh, this is just nations. It doesn't include the ETFs. I think if you included the gold bullion ETF, it would be between China and France. It's actually funny that with the ETFs, the retail investors own more gold than China. Uh, that shows you how, how much further we have to go with the re-monetization of gold by central banks. If they're really going to own it as a reserve asset, uh, they're going to have to increase their buying. I won't go over that chart. It just shows you debt, bad, problem still there. Um, what should you expect? Well, uh, a little bit of everything, uh, mostly bad. Um, but watch out for the bank collateral problem in the United States. Uh, the Treasury bond bubble could probably go on longer. But what's going to happen is the Fed's going to become and quickly is becoming the largest owner of Treasury debt. So uh, it's, it's going to buy the Chinese debt. The Chinese aren't going to refinance it. And the Fed's going to end up stuck with all this stuff. But this is the last question I want to deal with, uh, second to last question I want to deal with, is this question, everybody, this is the trade right now. This is the million-dollar question in asset markets, in, in my opinion. Everyone knows the dollar is going down. Everyone's trying to find a way to profit when the Chinese allow their currency to appreciate. We don't know when that's going to happen or how it's going to happen. But what would you own? What would you buy? What would you invest in if, if you thought that that was going to happen? Well, this was an, another story from the Barron's article. It showed that last year... China spent as much money 
acquiring hard assets across the world as it did in U.S. Treasury bonds. So this is a tipping point in its, uh, in its reserve allocation strategy. It's, it's acknowledged that it's probably going to lose money on its $2.3 trillion in Forex reserves, so it wants to spend some of that money uh, on hard assets. So you can see over here that for 2010, the projection is uh, parity, basically, that China will spend as much on hard assets as it will on U.S. debt. And you can see that uh, its net purchases of U.S. bonds declined precipitously last year, while its uh, net purchases of foreign assets, when they're not rejected by national governments, <laughs> uh, tend to increase, right. especially in Africa. Uh, I, this slide is in the wrong place, uh, but I'll go, since I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll go over it anyway. Uh, um, people always uh, ask me, well, geez, you can't eat gold. And I said, well, have you ever tried to eat a dollar bill? It doesn't taste very good either. That's not the point. The money system we have right now doesn't have any of these principles. And we're talking about a sound money system and gold's uh, virtues as money. Uh, these are the ones that are often quoted, but I thought it was important to remind people. And that this higher level of benefits is massive. If these are the benefits from having a sound money system, why are we so scared of it? Are we scared of it because it means lower growth? Are we scared of it because it means government discipline? Are we scared of it because it means a lot of the credit generated growth of the last 30 years wouldn't have happened? Well, that's probably true. A lot of the growth in the world economy was, is kind of like brought forward. It's like the stimulus here in Australia where they said we want to bring forward growth so we can get the economy through this, this dry spell. Well, we spent 30 years bringing forward growth in the world based on fiat money. What do you think is going to happen when you take that money away? I think it's going to be a long period of people rebuilding their balance sheets and, uh, and not growing. So. I think this, this, uh, this environment we're getting into is going to be much more fractured than, than people expect. Um, many people will talk about this, so I won't spend any time, but it's obvious no one can print gold. Mine supply is going down. Uh, where to from here then? Uh, welfare state's breaking down. But this, never underestimate the power of the state. Uh, it, it, it's, unlike corporations, the state collects its revenues with threat of violence and at the barrel of a gun. So... Uh, I think capital controls and, and, and actually garnishing people's wages. The state has many, many tools left that are not conventional <laughs> to protect its interests. So I don't think it's going to be uh, entirely placid as we go there. But this is why I think we're headed toward a fundamental change in our relationship, not just with money, but with government. If fiat money is the ultimate product of government, and government has used that, it's done all these things. I made a list the other night when I was drinking a glass of wine, thinking, all right, I'm going to make a short list of of things that the credit bubble has allowed the government to do, things that fiat money has allowed the government to do that people probably didn't imagine. Some of these might be debatable, but uh, I think it's become a moralist, telling us what we should do rather than just saying, here's what's illegal. Uh, in the United States, there's millions of people in jail. Everything's illegal now, so on any given day, you're probably breaking three laws just walking out your door. Uh, it's become educator. I heard someone mention that earlier. Uh, postman, not very well still, doesn't really handle that. Um, regulator, not very well. Uh, and then some of these serious things, and of course the, the ones on the other side are, are probably the most important. Defender, that's what they normally say now when the government's creating an excuse to go to war. Attacker, which is probably more common. Lender to the financial sector, and borrower. But the government's bankrupt too, so um, we've got a problem. So uh, this may be an unsatisfying conclusion, because as I said, it, I'm, I'm, this is more about what I'm thinking right now. But if, if we go back to a 19th century style gold standard, which I don't think will happen, but let's just imagine for a second what that world would look like. And I, the reason I put this chart up here is I, I, I did the Google thing again. I said, 19th century gold standard. And I think this is a picture of, uh, yeah, this is here, here in Sydney, right? right? So imagine, back in the 19th century, how did people get rich? They produced things. They used free trade to sell them for a profit. They used that profit and they reinvested in factories, which made more products, which they traded to generate surplus value. It created wages, created jobs, created rising income. It promoted capital investment. It promoted thrift. It promoted con concern for the future. And it elevated everyone's standard of living. Oh, that's awful. 
<laughs> Why would we ever want anything that delivered all those benefits? Now, I wouldn't expect everyone to adopt these things, but I think that countries that adopt sound money practices will benefit in a real way from the benefits that come from, from practicing sound money. Now, Australia, I didn't talk much about it, um, and, and frankly, Australia is in a, in a sweet spot. Um, I will mention one thing that I'd like to talk about that I haven't uh, explored that much, but no one really noticed that during the height of the financial crisis, the government introduced what it called the financial claims scheme, which was deposit insurance on the entire Australian banking sector. So one of the effects of the GFC was that the government has made itself liable for the failure of the banks, uh, which is probably not reflected yet in its, uh, in its credit rating. And no one, no one considers it a possibility that the government would have to make good on bailing out investors in the Commonwealth Bank or, or in NAB. But from what I've read, there's been a fair few interesting uh, financial institutions that have, have collapsed in Australia. So I think keep your eye on, uh, on whether the government has bitten off more than it can chew. Um, and finally, uh, these sound like mostly European or American or Chinese problems. As long as Australia sells iron ore and coal and natural gas, and as long as the government keeps its deficit very small relative to the rest of the countries, isn't everything going to be okay? I don't know. I hope so. I'm, I live here, so uh, I hope that doesn't get too bad. But these things have a way of trans these problems, and they're serious problems, have a way of transmitting themselves uh, in these ways. Capital flows. Could, could be choked off. This would particularly hurt the banks, which borrow 30 cents out of every dollar they lend to the housing market. Uh, interest rates are not controlled by the Reserve Bank. They're controlled by the global cost of capital. So even though people hate when, when the Australian banks raise interest rates, and maybe they're doing it for other reasons, interest rates in Australia are not controlled by the Reserve Bank. They're controlled by the global cost of capital, and that, that will probably be more true. Um, commodity prices could collapse if China turns out to be a derivative of the U.S. credit bubble. And some of the times it's just confidence. You see the rest of the world going to hell. It doesn't exactly promote your own confidence in yourself. So I think um, you know, this general drawing in and planning for the future, it's probably not a bad thing. But as I said, um, it may not sound like it, but I'm wildly bullish <laughs> and wildly optimistic. I think uh, the gold standard or people having discussions about um, a more sound financial system will mean necessarily smaller government, more liberty, and, uh, and people just going about their lives instead of, you know, you open a paper here, and three quarters of the paper is discussion of how government policy affects your life. That's profoundly, profoundly discouraging <laughs> uh, when you're just trying to lead your life and, and do what you, what you like. So uh, I think uh, gold uh, will do quite well, obviously, and I look forward to uh, discussing it in the next few days. So sorry I haven't delivered you a, a very specific investment conclusion. But uh, I hope you enjoy the next few days, and uh, thank you for coming. It's good to see everybody here.